So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to introduce who's speaking to us today. I'm popping a lot in this mic, so I'm going to hold it a little further down. All right? But bow your heads, and we're going to get started. Father, thank you so much for just who you are, and thank you for us being able to come here and, and talk to you. I pray that uh, as Miss Reed comes and brings the message, that you would just uh, be with her and speak through her and help her to know that you're, you're with her, God. And I pray that everybody who's in this room, their ears will be open to receive what you want to say through her. And that this will be a super beneficial message, and it will lead to future discussions. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give Miss Reed a round of applause. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh man. Well, I'm really excited to be here. I'm not, I feel, I feel very good. I'm not nervous, been prayed up all morning. I'm not, are you nervous? I'm not nervous. I'm excited. I'm really excited to be here to talk with you all. Um, just to get you all to know a little bit more about me. I am Miss Reed. Um, I love my family, my fiance and my friends. I have some pictures up there of me. Um, I was not cool like Mrs. Barnett, and I didn't play soccer in high school and have like amazing, incredible like action pictures or anything. Uh, but these are things that, I'm, that I get really excited about and that I love. Um, I am a Cal grad. I started at Cal when I was in eighth grade, um, not too many years ago. And I also went to high school here and graduated in 2016. I went to Bellarmine University. Anybody know what Bellarmine is? It's a small university here. I studied uh, to be a teacher. Um, I studied education, and I graduated with my bachelor's in English, and uh, special ed, and middle school. And so, and now I'm here today. But in college, school was a difficult thing for me. Um, actually, it was, it was a big struggle for me. I really loved always hanging out with my friends and my family, but I did not like school. Like when I was here at Cal, it, it, was, it was not great. I, I had a tutor. Uh, Miss Honor actually helped me a lot through college as well because I struggled a lot. And so I'm blessed to have a sister that was willing to do that for me. Um, but through college, um, I studied a lot about um, development because when you, when you study to be a teacher, you don't just study like what kind of rules to give your students or what kind of tests to give your students. You do study those things sometimes. But what you also study is human development, which sounds more like a science thing, but every teacher always has a kind of, has, has a knowledge of this. So just like, for example, like a baby. A baby that's 12 months to three years old, uh, they, have emotion, they have emotions, right? Everybody has emotions. And if any of you all have ever met a baby that's 12 months old or three years old, um, you know that they throw temper tantrums. And that's because they're beginning to discover their emotions. They get happy, they get excited, they get angry, they get frustrated. And all of, all of this bundle of emotions just explodes into a temper tantrum, right? And that's just because they don't completely understand the emotional, um, the emotional spectrum. Now you all are at this age where you all do understand these things, right? We understand what it means to be happy and what it means to be sad. I see it every day that <laughs> you all know what it means to, hap to be happy and what it means to be sad. Um, but human development was a really, really cool thing to learn about in college because I learned how my brain worked. I didn't just study like middle school brains. I also studied like a baby and like kids that are like five, six, ten, like all the way through age 21, I think is where we, is where we studied up to. And it was so interesting because I began to understand why I was the way that I was. And I remember what I was like in middle school. And studying like the brain activity and like your behavior and you know the things that you begin to understand as a middle school student, like that's that's what I began to become really interested in so that I could learn to be closer with my students when I was a teacher and I knew how to understand what they were going through, not based off of my own experience, but also understanding the scientific side, uh, which was really cool. Um, 
moving on to the next slide. Um, the really interesting thing um, is how God created us. He, he created us for multiple purposes, but one of the cool things is that he, and he created us as humans that are intelligent and that also have emotions, right? Um, emotions have a huge, a huge influence on how we think, um, like our perception, our attention, uh, learning, memory, reasoning, and problem solving. So for example, um, how many of us, just raise your hand. I'm not asking you all to speak out. My students know I, I like raised hands. How many of you all enjoy movies, right? Okay. Now, how many of you all enjoy Marvel movies? That's a, that's a lot of us. I love Marvel movies. Now, I get emotionally invested in Marvel movies, so I pay a lot of attention to a Marvel movie when I'm watching it, right? So that's just an example of how your emotions are attached to how you perceive things, what you pay attention to, everything like that. Um, God also created us as humans to have um, self-awareness, right? Self, does anyone ha have, a lot of you all, my students, have I talked about self-awareness before? Yes, I've definitely talked about self-awareness. I've talked about how it's really important to be self-aware and something that I'm sure a lot of you all are, but I've witnessed it with my students, is that they're very self-aware. They know, um, you know their faults and they know how they wanna get better at things. That's being self-aware. So growing up, I struggled with being self-aware. I thought that I was, but I was not. So in high school specifically, I struggled with this for a long time and I still do today, but specifically in high school, um, I, like I said, I loved being uh, close with my friends. And I got really close with my friends and um, they, I think they saw me as someone that they could, could that they could confide in. And, and I wanted to be that for them as well. I wanted to support them just like all of us do for our close friends. And they would confide in me and they would tell me um, a lot of things that they were going through. They would tell me about their struggles, um, things that may be go going on at home, um, stress that they have from academics or sports, whatever it is, you name it. A lot of these things you all probably struggle with as well. And when they would be telling me these things, my brain would be going in overdrive thinking, what can I do to help them? What can I do to fix this? What can I say to make them feel better? Just because that's kind of who I am. I'm a very relational person, and I want to do whatever I can to help and to make my friends feel supported and seen. Um, so this was um, not the best thing for me to do, to just carry all these things on my own. I never took it to God. I kind of just took it on my shoulders as my own problem, and that, um, that was not a great thing because what would happen is eventually my emotions and everything that I invested into my friends and um, helping them, I would just event eventually end up emotionally breaking down. And I did that a lot in high school until I finally realized that I needed to bring these things to God because these were not my things to carry. I had my own issues to deal with as well that I needed to figure out with God so how am I able to carry somebody else's burden on top of mine? We don't have to do that. Um, so to this day, I still definitely do struggle with this, uh, but with the support and love of my family, my friends, uh, my fiance, um, it's, it's definitely still a journey. And I'm not saying that it just changes overnight, but it's a gradual thing. Um, so there are so many things in the world that affect people's mental health. And to cover a few, and uh, Ms. Barnett also talked about some of these, um, was social media. Social media is definitely one of them. I think social media, and I can probably credit this to my dad. I talk a lot about social media with my dad. He doesn't have it, uh, but he certainly has an opinion on it. It can be such a great thing if we had made it to be. But because we're human and because of our sinful nature, we use it in bad ways, right? There's cyberbullying whenever you're scrolling through Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat or whatever, you're constantly comparing yourself to someone. Whatever, whatever experience you all have with social media, in some light, sometimes it can be bad. Um, and because of the easy access that we have to the internet and social media, everyone is prone to react emotionally to anything and everything online, and that affects our cognitive process. Just like what I said before about how emotions play a huge part in how we think, what we pay attention to, everything is all connected. And this, just, this also doesn't just go for social media as well, just like what Ms. Barnett said last week about um, something that 
a person had said to her, and that affected how she thought, what she thought about herself and her self-worth. Um, so this isn't just also on social media. This is also to the words that you say to your friends every single day, whether it's a joke or whether you're just, you know, just saying it in passing, not thinking it's a big deal. Your words have a huge effect on what other people think. Um, so the first point that I have is how mental health is glorified in our world today. And the reason why I say it in those words is because you look at the TV shows that we watch and the movies and whatnot. Um, there's a specific um, series that I've thought about of how it seemed like mental health was glorified. It was kind of like dressed up into this, into this thing that everybody had to identify with. It's just like, oh, if you're sad, you probably have depression. Like if you're just sad about one specific thing. Now let me get something straight. I am not trying to say that mental health is not important at all. Mental health is extremely important. But the way that you understand mental health is even most important. Because there is a worldly view of mental health, and there is also a biblical perspective of, of mental health. Um, we live in a world where, you know, people your age, you all have a lot of feelings. You all go through a lot on a daily basis. You all have a lot to do. And that can get really stressful. Okay, and you all get tired, and you have all these emotions. Something that I study in college is that this is the transitional change between, like, you know, you're in fifth grade, and then you go to middle school, and suddenly you're in high school. That transition is so quick. So all of you all are growing up so fast, which is a really awesome thing. But also, the enemy wants to use your vulnerable times against you. He is always going to attack you when you are doing your best. Especially, and I think this is something that Mr. Barnett has talked about before, when you are trying to do your best to further your faith with God, when you're taking care of other people, when you're trying to build community, whatever it is that you're trying to do good, that is when the enemy is going to attack you most. So when you just feel like, I'm trying to do all these good things, I'm trying to be a good Christian, I'm trying to pray, I'm trying to read my Bible, I'm trying to take care of my family, I'm trying to uh, be there for my friends, but I just feel so weighed down. I can't do this right, I can't do this right. That is the enemy trying to attack you because he sees that you're doing good and he hates that. So that is when he is going to attack you most. And that is when he might start to pull in anxiety or depression. Those are all tactics that the enemy uses against you. God created emotions, but he did not create depression anxiety, everything like that. Okay, those are all tactics that the enemy uses against you. Um, so what does scripture say about mental health or our thinking? In Romans 8, 5 through 6, it says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Makes sense, right? You focus on the flesh, you're going to get the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is is life and peace. So what this is saying is if, and you know, this kind of goes into our next point, um, our next point is how words have power. If you are struggling with depression or anxiety, whatever it may be, I will use the words you are struggling with it. It is not yours to have. Um, something that um, I learned from my mom a lot um, and Miss Honor can probably attest to this, uh, your words have power. And I know that what you think is just like, okay, words, words having power, how does that play into mental health? It has a huge role in mental health because um, something that I want to encourage my students in and even my friends when I talk to them is they say, oh, my, my anxiety is just starting to flare up or my depression, and I'm even cringing inwardly saying it, and what I'll correct them and say, no, 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 don't say my, because it's not yours. It does not have to be yours. You can say that you struggle with it because the enemy attacks you daily. And it's something that you're going to struggle and battle against. But it's not something that you have to take onto yourself. As long as you keep saying words like my and I have this, you are putting a label on yourself and you are walking every day of your life with that mentality of it's mine. 
I have this, I'm carrying it, rather than saying I'm struggling with this or I'm battling this. Um, so it's really important to remember how much your words have power. Um, the enemy uses every single thing you say and he'll twist it and he'll use it against you. So when you say it's mine, he's going to continue to like throw in little reminders or little insecurities and saying like, remember this, like this is yours, it, you know, I'm using, he, he's not going to say I'm using your words against you, but he is, that's what he's doing. So as long as you continue to say like my anxiety, my depression, you are only kind of placing that burden further and further on yourself and you have authority of your thinking. You have authority over what you think. You can pull yourself right out of it. Something that um, my sisters do, um, sometimes I get a little moody if I'm a little bit tired. I know Miss Honor's giving me a look, but it's true. When I get really tired, I get real quiet and I just get, like a, I just get a little bit snappy. And then if we're all together, what typically my oldest sisters will do, I'm the youngest of four, is um, they'll say, okay, everybody just give your biggest smile, which sounds, it sounds so silly, but if you smile, it's like you're forcing yourself to like cheer up a little bit. Just because when you posture yourself in a certain position, you're going to take on that feeling, right? So sometimes I'll do that like by myself if I'm in my classroom and it's a rough day and it's lunch time. Like I'll look like a crazy person because I'm smiling, trying to cheer myself up so that I can be my best self and so that I can posture myself to become what I want, what, where I want to be, right? So. Words have power. Um, let's see. Um, the thing I want to talk about next is um, what our directive is. And that means, like, what's our goal here? Okay? So, with mental health, everything like that, yes, I struggle with it every day. But, you know, where, if I'm going to struggle with it every day, what am I, what am I supposed to do? You can constantly look to God. In Hebrews 2, um, we read about how Jesus became fully man. Um, and it also talks about where we are, like kind of in the hierarchy of like, you know, there's God and then there's the angels. We are lower than the angels, yet God has placed us in his creation so that we can exercise his rule and reign to be able to further his kingdom and to be able to take care of, of his creation. That's, that's our job. It just seems like we kind of live in it day to day, but that is what our job is. Um, and these are all, these are all words. I, I, ha I had a hard time kind of understanding this question, but I feel like everybody in here can probably relate. Have you all ever thought, like, if God is so powerful and he, if he's so good, why, why does sin exist? Why does death exist? And it's exactly what we've been talking about since Mr. Barnett talked about it. It's the fallout. Sin and death entered the world. Okay, and I think that statement of if God is all good and he's all powerful and he hates evil and he can get rid of evil, then why doesn't he? When we talk about the cross, it completely changes the direction of this. Of this. And I heard my pastor speak about this on Sunday and it helped me understand that, you know, there's, there, it's not that there's not an answer to it. Why doesn't God just get rid of all the sin if he hates it so much? God could pay for sin but he shouldn't because we were the ones that sinned and rebelled against him in the beginning when Adam and Eve fell. And we should pay the price for the sin, but we can't because even if we live the rest of our days not committing any sin, that does not at all make up for the original sin, everything that we did before, right? So instead of us dying and giving up our lives, God showed us how much he loved us by giving us his son, and sacrificing him instead of having us die. And so with that, with that in mind, we should be living our days looking to him. So it's not like a, why doesn't God just help me? Well, when you're praying, how much are you posturing yourself to actually be listening to him? If you're struggling with something so much, he wants to pour joy and love into you. He's already healed you. We, we always talk about, you know, by his stripes, I'm healed. When he died on the cross, he healed you. So you just need to walk in belief and remembering and saying, I'm, I'm healed in the name of Jesus, and you need to believe it because your disbelief is what prevents you from receiving what God wants to give you every day. 
So what I want you all to remember is the difference between the secular worldview and the biblical worldview of mental health, and that your words have a lot of power, and you should speak life into other people, and you should also speak life into yourself. Because, like I said, when you say that, oh, it's, it's mine, or I have this, you're only kind of claiming it, right? Make sense? But you don't have to, because it's not yours to claim. It's not something that God made and is giving you. That's not the kind of God that he is. And so speak life into, your, into yourself, and be careful with the words that you say to others. Because the opposite of speaking life into someone is cursing them. And that sounds so drastic and so dramatic, but that's the truth. When you are not speaking life into someone, you are speaking a curse over them. So I, I know that sounds so drastic, but I want you all to understand that the enemy is constantly trying to bring you down every day. Spiritual warfare is a huge thing. He's going to do everything and anything he can to bring you down. But that's, we, don't, we don't have to fall through with that because God already won. And the last thing I want to reiterate is how God has placed us on the earth to exercise his rule and reign over creation. And we can't get lost in the worldly things. So as, mu as much as we begin to think about and worry about, oh, I have anxiety, oh, I have depression, oh, this, this is happening, like, why does death exist? All of these things, as long as you continue to dwell on that and not the answers that the Lord is trying to give you, you're just going to get lost further and further into the worldly things. And of course, you're not going to be able to understand what God is trying to tell you because you're not listening. You have to actively seek what he is telling you every day, what he wants to heal you of, what he wants to encourage you to do, how he wants you to reach out to someone who might be struggling. So all of these things are things to remember. Um, and I want to pray us out before we get dismissed. So everyone bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this unique opportunity um, that I've been allowed to um, come up and talk to these students. Um, I pray for um, any of the requests, uh, the prayer requests that students may have, teachers, administrators, um, that you would just continue to reveal yourself to them every day as you are always present. Um, I pray that we would continue to walk in faith with you, um, remembering that um, you have already provided the ultimate sacrifice and that we are healed and that we can walk in that healing every day so long as we choose to. I pray that you would help us keep our path straight um, to be able to focus on you um, and that we would not listen to the lies of the enemy and that we would be mindful um, of the words that we say about ourselves and about others. Um, I thank you so much uh, for this week and I pray that we would continue to seek out and to see your everyday graces that you provide every single day. All of this in your name I pray, amen.